We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. Lots of my clients were brought up in families where people didn't speak about emotions or they were actively suppressed. Not surprisingly, they have trouble naming their feelings. And when I ask them to list any feelings, whether they have them or not, they have trouble getting past 10. So I bring out a research project that found the top 500 feelings gleaned from one day on the internet recording every time someone typed, I feel dot dot dot. As you can imagine, it blows my clients' minds that there are quite so many. But what is really interesting is one emotion we quite regularly feel and crops up all the time in my therapy room, does not rate anywhere, not even at number 500. That feeling is shame. My witness today is Dr. Stephen B. Poulter, who is a Los Angeles-based clinical psychologist in private practice with 30 years of experience. He's the author of The Shame Factor, Heal Your Deepest Fears and Set Yourself Free. Now, Stephen, does it surprise you that we are so bad at owning up to the feeling of shame? It is startling is when I was asking people to write the introduction, ask some colleagues, we're talking PhD or MDs, medical doctors, and they go, I don't have any shame. I'm like, oh my God, okay, we, we've got a problem here. <laughs> we, Houston, we got a problem here. And that 500 emotions, I was thunderstruck. They didn't acknowledge shame. Yeah, I think it's because, you know, we are so against actually saying, you know, we can say the top five were things like, I feel good, I feel fine, I feel bad, I feel the same. But to actually type out, I feel shame, even in the privacy of your own home to your computer, seems almost impossible. It's just extraordinary. Now, let's sort of start off by actually really defining shame, because you call it a primary emotional wound. So tell me what you mean by that and what we're talking about. I refer to shame as being intrinsic. It's like having a marble counter, and inside the marble, there's these veins that may be absolute white granite with it, but there's grains of brown. That's what shame is. Shame's intrinsic. It's not guilt related to an action, but it's intrinsic. It's inside of us that there's a sense that we've done something wrong. We're not good enough. On top of that will be anger. I feel bad. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. But down at the core, many times, I feel defective. Shame is the deep sense of feeling defective. And it's different from guilt, isn't it? We need to explain the difference between shame and guilt. So tell me about guilt. Guilt is I uh, lied to somebody or I didn't pay for dinner. I feel guilty about that. I forgot to do something or I was rude. Guilt is action driven where shame is internally driven. There's outside issues. It could be as benign as looking at somebody and feeling terribly shamed that you're looking at them essentially where guilt would be, I did something, an actual action. Now there's good shame too. And I want to throw that out. Good shame is part of the moral compass. The shame I'm talking about is what's paralyzing, what causes people to feel impending doom, fear. A good shame. I'm just having a bit of a problem understanding that. So perhaps you'd like to give me a bit more about good shame. Sometimes good shame is a moral compass. People say, well, what's the difference between guilt? Guilt is I feel bad about what I did. Good shame is the internal compass. Like, I really shouldn't say that. It's a kind of a monitor, a governor, if you will. People can talk about it being part of your intuitive nature. And it goes on the other side where shame becomes paralyzing is when it immobilizes you with these different emotions, such as impending doom, despair, imposter syndrome, is all shame driven. Let's turn the the spotlight on you for a second, because if you're going to sit down and write a whole book on shame, you must have some kind of relationship with shame yourself. So tell tell me about (laughs) you, you and shame. I'll, I'll do my confessions later. Yeah, you know, Andrew, you are spot on. Writing the book three years ago, it was horrendous because I've talked about shame for years. 
you know, there's anxiety, depression, shame. In the religious communities, we call it sin. Hindus call it maya. Buddhism calls it distraction. But this part of us, or ego, where we don't feel good enough. And I think I've struggled with that through the years. And I found my clients, no, it's not anxiety. It's not, I go, is it shame? And when you talk about it, people understood, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's shame. But what's shame? Shame is that glue inside of you that feels like, ah, it's sticky. It's not clean. And so I wrote the book because I felt like there's not enough material out there. The book is more clinical than I wanted it to be. I want it to be more interactive and very accessible to people. But it helps people understand the triggers, the behaviors that get dismissed as, well, that's just my personality. Okay, it is, but there's part of it might be tainted. The best analogy is this gold brick inside of you. Shame covers it up with mud. And our work is, is to hose off the mud, remove the mud to get down to the gold brick inside of you. So there's a gold brick inside of you and shame is the mud that's actually covering it up. Now, that's a beautiful analogy. Thank you. I mean, most people, I think shame starts or comes from their childhood. I mean, what did you feel shame about as a child? Shame, I'm going to answer that question. By the age of five years old in child psychology after World War II, pretty much came to the conclusion where children either feel competent or inferior. That's the spectrum, Andrew. And I had a reading challenge. It felt it was hard to read. So I felt very defective, like I wasn't smart or I wasn't capable. And that doesn't breed competence. It breeds despair. By age five, you see that in children, whether it be finger painting, making something in the sand pile. It's very apparent. Kids that feel competent, kids that feel inferior. Can that be sort of domain specific? So you'd be, for example, perfectly good at reading, but you'd have trouble mixing with your classmates, for example. It goes back to what's going on at home because that gets back to your child's self-esteem by Dr. Dorothy. She talked about how we speak to our children is how they feel about themselves. And I don't want to get too much on, you know, rainbows and unicorns, but how we speak to children is how they feel about themselves. And there's a lot to that. And I talk about that in the book. What what are the sort of things that our parents say that could potentially shame us that we wouldn't immediately? I mean, obviously, if it's terribly obvious, like, you know, you're a waste of space, I mean, obviously, we'd immediately spot that. But my suspicion is sometimes it's much subtler than that. So what are the sort of messages that your clients get that Mm -hmm. might not necessarily be immediately identified as shame? One of them, Andrew, is neglect. The child comes home at three and a half from preschool and they did this finger painting. Yes, it looks like someone threw paint on a piece of paper. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, what is that? And you go, oh my God, that's gorgeous. What'd you think? Neglect is a bigger issue in child development than yelling, screaming at children. Because kids get, okay, mom's in a bad mood, dad's in a bad mood, but then they calm down. Neglect is more pervasive. Like you're not noticed. You don't feel important. I find neglect is a very big creator in shame. And what about inconsistency that one day they're neglectful and the next day they're all over you or, you know, they're... It creates in the child that the world's not a safe place. It's consistently inconsistent. And that's the dialogue because children have this ongoing videotape, you know, and consistency builds the world safe. And that really doesn't foster shame because the world's not safe. We know this. Children think it's their fault. That's why age five is such a big deal, Andrew. You know, people, oh my God. But at age five, if things are chaotic at home, it's got to be my fault. It's got to be my fault. That's the thing that we as adults know is not true. I mean, I am as I'm treated is sort of the only way that when we are five years old that we can actually understand the world because we really can only understand ourselves. So we think if our mother or our father ignores Mm -hmm. us, it's about us. We haven't got the imagination or leap yet to think, well, uh, mum's depressed or dad's drinking yeah. or whatever yeah, it is. Andrew, that is spot on. That's why shame is so pervasive because the cement is wet, but there's these fingerprints in it that says you're not good enough. Because if I was good enough, my mom and dad wouldn't argue or my dad wouldn't have left or my mom wouldn't drink too much. I mean, kids personalize it. Because shame at the end of the day, people ask me, give me one sentence. Shame says you're not good enough. Not good enough child, not good enough father, husband, wife, child, employee. Therapist. 
therapist. Oh my God, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, pick your poison as I couldn't get my computer going this morning, but it's there. And we're going to talk, Andrew, about how to minimize it. You know, on a scale of zero to 10, zero to two is normal living, but you don't want to get much above a five, six or seven because then it becomes emotionally paralyzed. I mean, one of the good things is we're now actually talking about shame, but yes. you and I were growing up in the 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. They weren't really talking about it. So were you aware that you were carrying shame around with you? It's interesting. I knew that I felt like something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't feel depressed. I mean, I did at times or anxious, but it drove me into reading, researching. And I remember seeing an article in the early 90s about shame. And it changed me because it, the author talked about shame is that hunter always hunting the hunter or the being terrorized by the terrorist. And that was John Bradshaw. He brought shame out in the late 80s and really brought it onto the national world scene, if you will. What made you go into therapy yourself? In this life, I always wanted to work with people, help me. And that was always an internal motivation. I started off thinking I'd be a forest ranger and kind of evolved into becoming a, a therapist working with people. So kind of with the whole gamut. So when you went into therapy yourself and your therapist said, I think that you've got shame here, how did you respond? How did you feel? He didn't say that. Didn't he? No. I thought he said, Stephen, you're struggling with shame. That was therapist number two. Oh, therapist number two. Because <laughs> the first therapist said, I think you're anxious. I'm okay. But then it feels deeper than that because anxiety felt more situational. This felt more foundational, like there's something wrong. And that's why people build these walls. And my therapist, Dr. Winston Gooden, says to me, I think, Stephen, you're struggling with shame. And it's like the light went off. Okay. I don't know why, but that really made sense to me. And we discussed the ins and outs of shame, essentially what you and I are discussing today, how it operates. What did he do? How did he help you? I think to normalize that perfection is a form of self loathing. Mm, perfection I like is, that. is shame covered up as self loathing. And if you're not perfect, therefore you're not good enough. And that's where I kind of got onto the freeway. That was kind of my on ramp. You were a bit of a perfectionist, were you? Yeah, or that I didn't feel like I was capable enough or smart enough, whatever the sentence was. But the idea that if people see me as not being good enough or capable, therefore I'm unlovable. Because that's where shame really, and that's the handcuffs to the chair, is that you don't think you're lovable. And that's why people hide these false personas, all this stuff we see in. Or they're forever trying to get their partner to show that they love them. They're setting right. tests for them all mm -hmm. the time. Or they're trying to do it externally. You know, I got this big home, a lot of money, travel, but it's not going to get cured on the outside because it's an inside issue. It gets resolved within. Here's a quote of yours that really spoke to me. The denial, avoidance, and the emotional trauma is the perfect setting for shame's growth and control in our lives. Yes. Avoidance is so powerful. It's the heart of compulsions, the heart of addiction. I don't want to feel these uncomfortable feelings. And they may be very buried very far down. And the denial is, it's not a big deal. My mom died when I was 12. Or it's not a big deal. My brother got killed. Or it's not a big deal. When I was 15, this happened. Probably zero to 18, there's something very big happened, a very big event. And I've seen that with a lot of my clients. Well, not for the sake of looking in the past, but what was something that's very traumatic in your background? I had a client say to me yesterday when she was four, her father committed suicide. Ugh. And when she came home from nursery school, her mom said her dad went away and won't be coming back. She knew that wasn't true. It's almost like a double wound because not only have you lost your father, but you've sort of lost trust in your what your mother says to you is true as well. Absolutely. And then you don't develop that you can listen to yourself, Andrew, that you can trust your own instincts. Ah, yeah, I see that. It's like a triple wound then. You actually right. lost trust in yourself as well. Yeah, that's the end result. You're told, don't trust your instincts. You know, that's the breeding ground for avoidance. Like I'm looking to other people to tell me what to think or feel. Now, do you find that shame shows up in different ways for men and for women? I mean, my experience is that generally men become angry. And although there's self-loathing in it, 
it's sort of pushed back with the anger and sort of almost pushed out. The loathing is pushed out. Whereas for women, it tends to be more going inwards. I mean, do you see that as well? Or do you think the difference between men and women in shame is minimal? I think it's significantly different. I mean, it's profoundly different. In this country, the United States, these mass murders are committed by men. Yep. Men externalize it. Women tend to internalize it. There's a statistic. Men will attempt suicide four times more often than a woman. But if, when a woman attempts suicide, she's four times more successful. Women internalize it, where men will just externalize it to the world violently, where a woman will turn it in on herself violently. Eating disorders, bulimia, things of that nature, an abusive relationship. So I think we've given people a very good idea of what shame is. And I think now we've got to perhaps give them some hope. And and I find myself wanting to ask, if it's so deeply entrenched in us, and it's there since we were five, can we get it out, so to speak, or at least have a better relationship with it? Yes. There's an old saying, a room can be dark for a thousand years. And when you open the door and you put a candle in there, it's as if it was never dark. And that's mm. true of shame. Regardless of its history, it can be healed and it's amenable to treat. It takes courage, but it's amenable to treat. And there's so much emotional freedom that comes through it as a result of this process, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, spiritually, all the components. So let's look at five keys to exposing your fear connection to shame. Now, why is our fear connection to shame so important? Fear keeps shame safe. Right. I want to put it slightly differently. Fear keeps shame locked in to your personality or into the way that you're living. Absolutely. Very well said. Fear is the gatekeeper of shame. Ah, oh, uh, yeah. Now I've got it entirely, the relationship, the gatekeeper. So I'm going to take you through your five keys. The first one is expanding your comfort zone. How do we expand our comfort zone? You know, it gets back to the point we made a few minutes ago about tolerating uncomfortable feelings. Because the comfort zone, many times, is our safety zone. And to deal with shame, we have to look at some stuff that happened. Maybe our sexual abuse or something that happened that was profound that we buried. That's expanding our comfort zone. You know, there's an old saying by Robert Blake, rather than be judgmental, be curious. Curiosity can help us push the boundaries out, expand that. So understanding what the shame is, what triggers it, where it comes from, actually helps push back the comfort zone. So instead of living in a small space, we're living right. in a ah, a little bit of a bigger right. place. Well, your life isn't becoming smaller and smaller, emotionally, mentally, socially, relationally, career-wise. Because ultimately, exposure is opening the door to the dark dungeon. And once the light gets in there, shame can't function. You're unplugging it. It doesn't work. So the next thing you talk about is built-in fear limits. Tell me about those. You know, there are people that they have like a, a glass ceiling emotionally, where they don't want to feel, I'm not talking about this. Or I have many men say to me, tell me about your relationship with your dad. It was fine. They say it that quickly. I'm like, oh, okay, clearly it wasn't. So because <laughs> if it was that good, you wouldn't have to cover it up so quickly. Nothing to see here. Nothing no, no, to see good, here. Yeah, okay. We are so not good. Let's do something. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be lots of, I'm, I'm afraid, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of women who are sitting here saying, yes, Stephen, you know, I know my husband is going to say, you know, nothing to see here. How do I encourage him that it might be worth seeing something here? Many times men change with two things happening, despair, locked in with curiosity. When they lost their job, they got a cancer diagnosis. There's something that breaks through the wall. There's an event, a traumatic event. God forbid a loss of a child or their job or their career or their savings account. You know, something's happened. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, it's their wife is threatening to leave them. Or has left. Or has left, even worse. Yeah, I find when women leave, Andrew, that they don't come back. And that the man, because of his shame, just doesn't heed all the warnings, all the red flags. Where men leave and they're open, now they'll talk. Oh, okay, you know, they made a statement. But when women leave, I have found this professionally, they don't come back. I mean, 20% do, 80% don't. When they leave, they're done. And that's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't stop 
you from potentially learning something important. Absolutely. You know, relationships, sometimes the ending is very healing. You know, it initially starts off, it feels like everything blew up. But I've had many women leave a marriage where they feel like their health improves, their breast cancer gets resolved because they're internalizing all that frustration and the stress hormones. So we're looking at the five keys to exposing your fear connection to shame. And the next one you talk about is emotional terrorism, relentless force. Emotional terrorism. It's like, I'm going to tell your secrets. Like, I know all your secrets. I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell the world. Ooh. How did you find those out then, Stephen? Right. Exactly. That's emotional terrorism. You see it in school now where kids bully. Because, well, I, I know your secrets. I always tell clients, well, what's the big secret? Oh, I'm gay. Okay. You don't think people close to you don't know that? I mean, when you expose the big fear, you can't be terrorized by it. And sometimes the big fear isn't something that's easy to label, is it? Like you've got a kink or something like that, that some people might consider bad, but it could be your big fear is something actually less easy to label. Correct. How do you help people find what that big fear is? I find it. A very common one is people's background was so erratic or chaotic or their dad went to prison or their mother left and never came back. To them, it's humiliating. They don't want anybody to know. And when we talk about it, realize you're not the only one in the world. This isn't a unique event. We're more similar than we are dissimilar. And that helps people to start to accept what they fear the most. So look for the humiliations. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, what causes you to shrink internally? And if you can actually name these humiliations, either put them down on a piece of paper for yourself or tell them to your therapist, then somehow once you actually say them and the the light comes on them, they're actually not really quite so humiliating as you think they are. Correct. Very powerful. Exposing that, and it sounds easy as we're talking, but that, that's getting out with the Great Wall of China inside of you. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of some of my own personal humiliations at this precise moment. And, you know, and I'm feeling a little um, queasy inside. I once did an exercise. It was a guided meditation on the subject of shame. And I thought that shame was the sort of the bottom feeling, but I sort of discovered another one underneath. Do you find that shame is the bottom feeling or there are other things underneath? Let me tell you what I yeah. found, and that yeah. might help you understand what I'm talking about. It might actually be that this is what we're talking about at the moment. But what I found under the shame mm-hmm. was a sort of aloneness that I'm sort of different from the rest of my family. Um, it's just the way I am sort of kind of mm-hmm. thing. I'm somebody who talks about emotions and feelings right. and uh, wants to lift up the stones. And the rest of my family are people that are quite happy to leave the stones where they are, thank you. Yes. So that sort of makes me a little bit different. I lived in a small town that was sort of not really very cultural, whereas, you know, I'm interested in museums. And when I finish recording this podcast, I'm off to an opening of an exhibition. You don't get many exhibitions in small towns. And if you do, Mm -hmm. they're of watercolours by the local art group rather than um, anything (laughs) sort of cutting edge. Yes. So in a sense, it was not surprising that I was alone, but that's what I discovered underneath the shame. It's not underneath the shame. That is a feature of shame that you're defective and you're alone because nobody wants to be around you versus you need to be in another place that's a better fit for you. Loneliness, part of intimacy, I talked about that, or mistrust, that the loneliness is that there's something wrong with me because I wouldn't be alone if there wasn't something wrong, as you described. And you moved out of that small town and you found your people and your life. Yeah. I mean, I think finding your tribe is something that's incredibly important. I'm go- One day I'm going to do a podcast on finding your tribe. So the next one of our five keys to exposing your fear connection to shame is loss of control, changes in the air. So tell me about that. In all Eastern psychology and mindfulness, there has come a point where you surrender that minute or that second of trying to control the outcome. I use the analogy, you hit the ball over the net. 
And at that point, you can't change the trajectory of the ball, can you? Or how it comes back to you. True. You have to suspend judgment. And that's what it means. It's very powerful. You know, you just got to let that gap be there for a second. You're not going to die. People find they're going to die if they really let go of that. Like if they've kept it so close, they've hugged it. Very profound. I'm not quite certain how loss of control and shame fit together. So perhaps you can just... Well, control keeps shame locked up. All right. Control is another subordinate of shame. Control works for shame. And so what you're saying is that when you are feeling in that position where you might feel shame, you've got to send the ball over the net. Mm -hmm. And once you've hit the ball, once you've done the thing, you've got to just let go and let the ball, let the action happen, let the feelings be. Another analogy to your point, Andrew, what we're discussing of the castle, control brings the drawbridge up and there's a moat around it. No one's getting in. Letting go of control is lowering the drawbridge. Letting old things out and new things in. Old information out, new information in. That is suspending judgment for a few minutes. Very powerful. You might find that after you've let some new things in, that you might feel different. Yes, you will feel different. The experience will change you. You will feel different. And then the fifth part is your full acceptance. At the end of the road, at the end of therapy, all the different modalities, all the mindfulness, is a sense of the acceptance of who you are. That is the key to your life. That is powerful. I mean, that's having all the wealth in the world in your hand, that you can accept yourself, therefore allows you to pursue, have a plan, do things with your life, say and think things that you might not have ever done. Very powerful. Or accepting that, yeah, I had a tough background and here I am today, but I'm not allowing that to paralyze me or to hold me back. And the time I come across shame the most is dealing with couples after infidelity. Both actually feel shame, the person that has been unfaithful and Mm -hmm. the person who has, to use the colloquial term, been cheated on because they feel that they were not good enough. That's why their partner went somewhere else. And their partner feels terrible because they've caused all this pain and heartache and they've been selfish. Every time that uh, shame comes up, the couple go into separate corners or they end up fighting each other. What do you do in situations like that? Affairs are not the cause of divorce. They're a symptom. Shame has to do with intimacy. If you get, for the sake of discussion, Andrew, if you get closer than six feet to me, you're going to find out my secrets or find out things I don't really want you to see. And that is how to get past infidelity. What is it? that's inside of you that you don't want your partner to see? Or what is it that you really need that you're afraid to address? It really helps heal, you know, to heal the collateral damage of the affair. Say those questions again, because I think those are really good questions. Intimacy, shame is like oil and water. They don't mix. Shame and intimacy don't mix. And that's why when I see affairs at a certain point in the marriage, they're getting closer. Had a baby, bought a home, everything close. But shame's not too close. So they bring a third party in. The only third party should come in is a therapist. And okay, it's the only third party, you know, because a neutral. And, third and please don't sleep with your therapist. Yeah, that's a really good point too. But I thought that was a given, but we'll uh, duly noted. <laughs> that's not productive. The third, it's shame and intimacy don't mix. They're incompatible. And understanding what that is. Okay, to create that distance, what did you do? Well, I started working 60, 70 hours a week. Or, you know, the wife may say, well, we have three kids, so I just put all my energy into the kids. It's not for a lack of love. It's a lack of intimacy. If you get too close, it's very uncomfortable. And so it'd be much better to actually think about what it is you're frightened of the other person discovering. What is your biggest secret that you don't want anybody to find out? Correct. And sometimes I do couples therapy, not individually. I mean, everything's transparent. There's no secrets. But you come to find out, The woman, when she was growing up, her dad left her mother and that there's no way she can keep a man's attention. And on some Mm -hmm. level, she's kept the distance in the relationship or the husband feels like, you know, that he's got this issue that he's not able to be a good provider or something. It sounds so simple, but it's so powerful. It's nuclear. It's Mm. nuclear energy. If you don't manage it, it'll ruin the relationship. 
Have you found out what you're most frightened of people discovering your big secret? Yes. And I'm not going to share it. <laughs> it's, it's not necessary. You've got to keep it as a right, secret. No, so I'm comfortable with it. I don't need to share that. I knew you were going to ask me that question. How did you know but, that? Andrew, after a while, you kind of read the pitch count. <laughs> you know, there's a curveball coming <laughs> and you just kind of wait for it. I would throw the question back to you. What is something that in your relationship would be your greatest fear or is? I think I've already told you that mine is that sort of sense of being different, not fitting in. I think it's important, as you said, to expose those things. And I mentioned earlier, I was kind of sparring with you here about not feeling good enough. And I think that has been something that's driven me to feel good enough. And I've come to accept that I am fine. Not arrogantly, like, okay, this is it. I'm going to do the best I can and genuinely do the best I can. And that really has freed me up. Like writing this book. <laughs> I've gotten a lot of hate mail and people criticizing. I'm like, that's okay. You know, for those that are interested, we'll read it. It's not for everybody. You got hate mail for writing a book on shame. Yeah, absolutely. How do people blow off on you writing a book about shame? You don't know what you're talking about. You don't have enough research. Ah. I go, but clearly, I don't answer this, but I've had a couple of people come to see me and talk about it. They say, clearly, it triggered something in you. And they're dumbfounded. Mm. You wouldn't be mad at me or mad about the subject if it wasn't in you. It's in you. And that's why I found the hate mail is another deflection. You know, it's another avoidance of what's inside of you. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So one of the new things we're doing on The Meaningful Life is we're inviting you to write in if you have a dilemma. And I'd like to say thank you very much to the woman who wrote in for this. Steve and I are going to talk about I divorced three years ago after 23 years of an emotionally abusive marriage and have just started online dating properly. I've done lots of therapy over the years and do feel that I have grown since my last relationship, but I'm sure there's a lot of unconscious programming that would be influencing my behaviour, outlook and choices. I've been having imaginary interactions and discussions with a South Korean actor because of the kindness and emotional attentiveness he portrays through his roles which are teaching me lots of things about relationships. My therapist says she thinks it's a healthy emotional repair work because we're having adult-to-adult conversations rather than anxious child wanting to be rescued. In these imaginary scenarios, he's accepting me no matter what feelings I'm showing and, a very unusual thing for me, I'm able to express anger and we work through the issues and resolve them creatively, meeting both people's needs. I do feel ashamed sometimes because I know that these interactions are imaginary, but for the first time I'm able to imagine what it might be like to be in a relationship with a loving, kind person who's emotionally available and who truly values me. I've also been taking some of the things I'm learning there and applying them in the real world. But I'm still confused and afraid that I will keep choosing men who are not good for me. I have three questions I was hoping you might be able to give your thoughts on. Since my automatic attraction is for men who are not good for me, do I try to go out with people I don't find attractive, or how can I learn to feel attracted to people who are good for me? That's question number one. Question number two, how do I stop myself from accepting someone, even if I do not really want to be with them, just to get the dating thing over and done with, and because deep down, I still don't really believe a truly fulfilling relationship is possible? Number three, Do you think my interactions with this very unavailable actor, since he's famous and I will probably never meet him, are another example of me chasing someone who's unavailable, or do you think they can still be healing for me? So, what are your thoughts on this one? We've got a lot of material there. I have several thoughts. One, that we call that psychodrama or role-playing, which he's doing with this actor, which is a great modality. You know, it's a creative narrative. And that gets back, Andrew, we talked about exposure tolerating the uncomfortableness. Secondly, I would ask this woman, what is it you really want in a relationship? Have four or five non-negotiables. That will help you to steer clear of the detours of that old pattern. And thirdly, I would ask her, I wonder, what is it that 
withdrew her and kept her in a 23 year marriage that was really very abusive and, you know, destructive to her. And the courage it took to get out of it, I would start there. What got you to move out of it? What did you do? You know, really work with what she's got there. Cause it took a lot of courage to do that. And I don't see her doing it again. Or if she goes down that road, she'll turn the car around after date number two, not date three or four years later. Do you go out with people that you're not attracted to? You know, it gets back to your list. It's important they're kind. They have emotional insight. You know, if physical attractiveness is your top priority, you know, that's different. What are the things that are really important to you? That's what I'd ask her. And I think she wants to slow down the process. I think what always happens is people make judgments in the first sort of five seconds, and those are your sort of old habits that are making those choices. I think give people enough time, let the possibility for attraction sort of breathe rather than actually making your mind up. Obviously, if they're absolutely ghastly, don't go out on Mm -hmm. a second date. If they feel creepy, don't go out on a second date. But if they're just sort of regular people and you don't feel one way or the other, give them a second date, give them a third date, enough time to actually see if there are things that you do find attractive. Maybe Uh it's your fear that is stopping you feel attracted to these people. I don't think you have to learn to feel attracted to people who are good for you. I think that if you start to listen to yourself, you'll know who is actually bad for you. Because I think your internal alarm system will go off. You know, if you slowly but surely attach to people, I think it's more likely to be a good connection. Absolutely, Andrew. I like what you said about that. If you get to know somebody, I've had men come out, like, she's not that attractive, but she's very kind. She's smart. She's considerate. She understands me. And after a while, he finds her incredibly attractive. Yeah, because, I mean, people being nice to you is incredibly attractive. Good people are attractive. That's where I would tell her, you know, the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover. I like what you said. Go on the second date. I mean, of course, you don't feel red flags. You know, he's an axe murderer, if you know, if you will. But he's a nice gentleman. He had a great time. I don't think there's any danger of you accepting someone just to be out of the dating field because I don't think you've been through all of this heartache to close your eyes. I think your eyes are now fully open. So I think you are going to know yourself well enough that you're not going to do that. Andrew, I want to throw one more thing out. As you were reading her letter, I would encourage her, don't personalize their responses. Do not. And that's strong. I, I would be number one. Well, he never called me back. We don't know why, but don't make it about you. You are not how you are treated. This is about them. It's about them. They're not phoning you because it's their stuff and it doesn't matter. That's a cautionary note for dating. Yeah. It's not about you, which in some ways is really rather sad, but also it's really rather liberating as well. And all this stuff about the actor, I think if you see it as a useful role play and you're getting something useful out of it, that is great. If you're starting to begin to fantasize about him and you're comparing him to the guys you're sitting across the table from, then that would be a bit of a concern for me. It sounds healthy at the moment, but be aware, because if you start comparing, oh, well, he's nowhere near as actor ABC, then I think that would be the time when I would begin to get a little bit I agree with you, Andrew, and I would want her to transfer what she gets from that into what she wants in dating, someone that understands her, someone who's kind. And in the same way that you're experimenting in other areas of your life, perhaps at work or whatever, by actually exposing your feelings, then you could try that with your dates as well and see what happens. Because if people can cope with all of your emotions, not just the so-called nice ones, they're probably a keeper. Yes. So uh, find out. And what I also think is quite good, we've been talking about what is your big secret you're trying to keep from people. And you say your big secret is, I don't really believe a truly fulfilling relationship is possible. You didn't put the two extra words that I think belong there for me. And I think that is your big secret. You don't believe a truly fulfilling relationship is possible for you. And now it's out there and we can see the shame 
hopefully it's a little less bad. Anything else you would suggest to cope with that um, I fear, like Stephen? I really like that. Because deep down she does believe it's possible or she wouldn't be dating. And she would be Correct. writing to she us be asking either. you this question. It's her defense mechanism against feeling disappointed and feeling that she's not good enough. Thank you very much for being my, my guest and my witness on The Meaningful Life today. Um, so I now have to turn the tables on you and ask what makes your life meaningful. I think it's, you know, I come from a uh, spiritual perspective of that we're here to make fulfill our plan. We all have a plan and to connect. And I, I find part of my plan is working with fathers and sons to connect, heal and help men become their best self. A lot of meaning for that. So do you actually work with the father and the son yes. in the same room? Frequently. Oh, that it's sounds really interesting. interesting. What have you discovered? I got one today coming in. Many times the son deep down, as mad as he is at the father, he deep down wants his acceptance. And the father's profoundly surprised that he doesn't know that. The son doesn't know that I do accept you. It's very powerful. It's transformational. Mm. And I'm talking the whole age range. It could be a 75-year-old with his 45-year-old son. Son says, I never, you've never said you love me. And the father, like, what are you talking about? You've been my driving force. You know, that's the kind of stuff that really fuels me because that, that's powerful. It's healing. My supervisor here mm -hmm. in Berlin, he believes that the best way for a man to become a better lover and have a better connection with a woman is to have a better connection with his father. What do you think of that? Uh, I think your supervisor is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so why should a better connection with your father give you a better connection with your wife or your girlfriend or the women? It gives you a better life? connection to yourself. And if you feel better about yourself, ah. you're kinder to people around you. Because the first man you ever loved was your father. Your mom loved you. That's not about your mom. But violent boys, to me, have three things in common. An absent father, they don't feel cared about, and they didn't get time with their dads. I'm not talking about fathers who died, but I'm talking about left in prison or never involved in life. And I find men who have a good relationship with their father are much kinder and gentler in long-term romantic relationships. There's been research done on that where boys that spent time with their dad growing up from age zero to 10 are much more stable in romantic relationships in their adult life. They're very connected. So what gives your life meaning is repairing the relationships between fathers Correct. and sons. How was your relationship with your father? You probably guessed this question was coming, no, didn't you? This is more direct. <laughs> no, Andrew, my father, he passed away over 10 years ago, and I always loved my dad. My sister doesn't share my sentiment. She's very critical of him. But my mm. dad, I knew my dad loved me, and I think he favored me. I don't know if that was good or bad, but I know that um, with him pushing me, it helped me to understand what I want to do in my life and working with people. You know, indirectly, he never said you need to do this or that, but the goal was do something meaningful and something beneficial. Don't worry about making money. Money comes because everything's about relationships in life. So when my relate, my dad, I've worked through, he was from Australia and came to the United States in the early 50s. So he wasn't Americanized, if you will. So it was different. And I've worked hard to forgive him for being absent so much. And now I appreciate what he did versus being judgmental. And there's a statement, Andrew, by Robert Bly. Men enter adult life the day they forgive their father. That's Robert wow. Bly. And I agree with him and I agree with your manager that I find men say, I can't be married. Tell me about your dad. What's the relationship? Indulge me. Just go with me on this. And we get into it. And I'm working on a new book about men, masculinity, and health. Because part of your health, physical health, has to do with your emotional health, your relationship health. And it goes back to your father, the first man that loved you. And your grandfather. All three. All three of you. I do a workshop that helps heal the father wound, and I do a guided imagination that uh, takes you back seven generations of fathers, and you imagine one of them after the other. I mean, obviously, there comes a point where you don't know what they look like, but still, it's a very yes. powerful um, guided thing to go back. There's something very powerful about oh seven goodness. generations. Fabulous.
we could talk forever and we can talk for longer in the bonus material. And if you'd like to hear the three things that Stephen knows deep down to be true, and I'm also going to talk to him about three mindsets, the mindset of the lizard, the owl and the eagle. Do you want to find out what that is? Well, you're going to need to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life. You can either subscribe directly through Apple and Spotify, or you can go to the Patreon page on my website, and here's the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.